Thanks to everybody who showed up on this dreary day in Boulder. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hale. I am the acting interim director of the Benson Center for this year while Bob Pazman was away in Paris doing research. Uh, there, I uh, we wanted to welcome to, welcome you to to this talk. This is now our sixth talk of the semester. We've been doing uh, a slew of talks already at the beginning of the semester, and we have plenty more coming up um, that I'd like to invite you to attend um, if you feel if you can find uh, space in your schedule. Um, I'm just going to read you a, a few for the upcoming month of October, then I'll invite you to go check out our website where you can find more information about events that are happening. Our website is just colorado.edu slash center slash Benson, and you can go to the events page there and see what's going on. But coming up later this week is our very own visiting fellow, Renaud Philippe Garner, who is giving a talk in the Center for Values and Social Policy titled For Whom We Do or Die, The Psychological Implausibility of Cosmopolitan Views of War. Uh, later next week, uh, on Wednesday, we have Colorado State Senator um, uh, Ray Scott uh, speaking on policies on climate and the environment. He's speaking over the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research, which is just over on Grandview over here. Uh, next week, the following week on October 15th, we have Jonathan Haidt from NYU coming in. He's speaking about uh, his book, uh, The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, that should be a fairly well attended talk. That's going to be in William, William, Williams Village. Uh, also uh, that week, the next day, we have uh, Senator, uh, Colorado St State Senator Steve Fenberg also talking over at CSDPR, the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research on uh, climate and the environment. Uh, later on the 21st, again the following week, uh, we have Robert Kennedy Jr. and Alex Epstein um, who are uh, debating, should we radically restrict fossil fuel use for, to prevent climate change? That'll be in the Glenn Miller Ballroom. And we have John Allison on October 22nd, Elaine Pagels, uh, noted uh, religi uh, religion scholar, uh, talking about Satan uh, on October 24th. If anyone of the talks is going to go poorly, it might be that one. Um, and then following that, we have our own uh, visiting uh, conserv conservative thought and policy uh, scholar, Colleen Shahan, speaking on October 28th on American Friendship. Uh, and that'll be in uh, the Humanities Building here in e uh, 1B90. So, I won't bore you with any more of our events because there are just a ton of them and you can check them out. But I wanted to introduce Bob Mary here who uh, is visiting us uh, from, from Washington State. Um, uh, Bob Mary is a noted journalist and presidential historian if you haven't done your research and read up on him before coming here. He, uh, he went to the University of Washington to earn his BA. Following that he spent three years in the US Army um, and then went to the Columbia School of Journalism. I believe he started his career here in Colorado at the Denver Post, right, where he briefly was, but then I guess he tired of our sunshine and moved to Washington, D.C. Right, to join the National Observer. Um, he eventually then started writing for the Wall Street Journal in 1977, where he covered Congress, national politics, and the White House. He did that for about a decade, uh, and then eventually became managing editor of the Congressional Quarterly in 1987, um, where he stayed for 12 years. During that time, he was, he was promoted to the executive editor uh, and, e and eventually, in 1997, became the editor-in-chief of the Congressional Quarterly. He's written for numerous uh, publications of note, uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the National Review, the American Spectator, and the National Interest. He's appeared, of course, on television as well, on Meet the Press, Face the Nation, Newsmakers, and many other programs. He's also written a fair number of books, he, including a book on President McKinley titled President McKinley, a book on James Polk titled, James. wrong, the, A Country of Vast Designs, a book on presidents as viewed through the eyes of voters and historians titled Where They Stand, and a book on foreign policy titled The Sands of Empire. Without boring you anymore, I'll introduce Bob Mary and let him give us his talk. Thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here back in Colorado. I was here for two years from 1972 to 1974. I can hardly remember it now. It seems so long ago, but it was grand, and I got really into the whole ethos of uh, Colorado and the Western thinking, and the, uh, uh, I think that's probably changed a lot by now, but it was wonderful at the time, and I remember it very, very fondly. Uh, I want to talk about American elites. In the spring of 1970, social commentator Peter Schrag produced a piece for Harper's Magazine entitled The Decline of the Wasp, which is really about the decline of the old Anglo-Saxon establishment of America. Schrag identified it as a particular class of people and institutions that we identify with our vision of the country. The people were white and Protestant. The institutions were English. American culture was WASP. 
He recalled a time when the critics, the novelists, the poets, the social theorists, the men who analyzed and articulated American ideas, who governed our institutions, who embodied what we were or hoped to be, nearly all of them were wasps. All that, he said, was now in progressive deterioration. He explained it's not that the wasps lack power and representation or numbers, but that the once unquestioned assumptions on which that power was based have begun to lose their hold. By way of illustration, he said, Gary Cooper has been replaced by Dustin Hoffman. The piece generated a great deal of attention at the time and much comment. One reader who responded was Stuart Alsop, then a very prominent uh, weekly columnist, back page columnist for Newsweek magazine, who had more than a passing interest in this phenomenon. After all, he was a member in good standing of that old establishment. His mother's first cousin was Eleanor Roosevelt. His, his maternal grandmother was Teddy Roosevelt's sister. And on the Alsop side, the family went back to the 1600 shipping trade in which they made tons of money and then went into railroads and investment banking. But the Alsop wealth had long since dissipated by 1970. But the social standing that was conferred as a result of this connection to the old families was still an Alsop family birthright. That was the nature of that tight old wasp clique. But even the birthright, as Alsop knew, was fading fast. The old wasp elite, he wrote, is dying, and it may be dead. Today, we look back on all of this as a kind of relic of the distant past, hardly worth noting. Or if we do, we often look back on it with disdain and its decline as a necessary development. I think it was a necessary development, but it was a development, this old elite's slow loss of confidence after World War II and the obliteration as a, its ob obliteration as a cultural force represents a profound transformation in American social history. America was becoming a new country, and therefore, inevitably, it needed a new elite. Okay. But troubling questions hover over this ongoing transformation. How do, how do we define this new elite? How well has it served the nation? Today, we have what we call a meritocratic elite, as opposed to the old Anglo-Saxon birthright elite. Today is, uh, today's elite is dominated by a class of strivers who manage to scope out the new system and rise to the top. This was captured in an Atlantic article of about a year and a half ago by a Matthew Stewart, who identifies himself as a member of the new elite, but nevertheless a critic of it. And he writes in that piece, the meritocratic class has mastered the old trick of consolidating wealth and passing privilege along at the expense of other people's children. He adds, he and his cohort are not innocent bystanders to the growing concentration of wealth in our time. No, he says, they are, and I quote here, the principal accomplices in a process that is slowly strangling the economy, destabilizing American politics, and eroding democracy. That's tough stuff. And it was merely an echo of the ruminations of social commentator, much more prominent social commentator Christopher Lash, who was writing as far back as 1995 on this same subject, in a book entitled The Revolt of the Elites and the Betrayal of Democracy, which was published posthumously. He excoriated America's new aristocracy of brains. He says that America always had a privileged class, but it has never been so dangerously isolated from its surroundings, he said. He foresaw an emerging chasm between the new upper class and the great mass of citizens. He wrote, and I quote, the new elites are in revolt against middle America as they imagine it, a nation technologically backward, politically reactionary, rep repressive in its sexual morality, middle brow in its taste, smug and complacent, dull and dowdy. When I read that recently, reread it, I couldn't help thinking about Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables because it seemed to reflect the kind of cultural chasm foretold by Lash. The mutual animus between the nation's elites and the people they purport to govern 
seems to me to be a bit of an ominous development in American uh, history and merits exploration. I believe that the exploration should begin with the old WASP establishment. So we will look at it a bit by way of comparison. But I want to emphasize here that this is no call for restoration. As I have written many times in different contexts, history moves on with a crushing force and does not pause for nostalgia or flights of lament. But to understand where we are, we must understand where we came from. And the old WASP establishment represents a large part of where we came from. It served from the beginning as the custodian of the nation's affairs. And the nation, in turn, looked to it instinctively for governance. The country and its elites shared the same provenance, after all. So it seemed kind of natural. Um, e. Digby Baltzell, an academic, writing in a book called The Protestant Establishment, Aristocracy and Caste in America, in I think 1968, says that the old system, quote, worked quite well and was taken for granted until the 20th century, largely because the WASP upper class was still representative of the country at large. And Baltzell adds, even when non-WAFs made it into upper reaches of society, they were assimilated the more e er easily, he says, because they constituted such a small minority. So there was a cultural symbiosis between the elites of the Northeast and the heartland masses, which spawned a relatively high degree of civic amity and a relatively, and relatively little class animosity if you compare America to European nations, for example. The acceptance of the elites by the masses generated a self-confidence at the top that in turn generated a kind of accommodative and perhaps we could say soft-edged leadership. Stuart Alsop captured this, and he wrote about this a lot, in describing the old elite, the old elite as self-confident and more or less disinterested people meaning they weren't necessarily strivers. They didn't need to be. Another occasion, he wrote of it as being self-respecting and respect commanding. Of course, Alsop was, had an had a ax to grind here a bit because, after all, he was part of that old elite and was watching its decline. But he watched it with a great deal of dis, uh, uh, dispassion. Uh, I think that the main point here is that the old elite did not strive for wealth or societal position. It had those things already, which made it the elite. But it would be a mistake to view this elite as soft or easygoing on matters of national identity or the country's political and foreign policy aims. This was captured in a brilliant essay by Benjamin Schwartz in Atlantic, in the Atlantic Monthly, it was called then, in 1995, Schwartz was then a very high on the Atlantic Monthly's masthead. And the piece was entitled, The Diversity Myth. In that piece, he punctured what the magazine, in introducing the piece, called the hortatory version of our history in which America has long been a land of ethnic tolerance and multicultural harmony. No, wrote Schwartz, until around the 1960s, the unity of the U.S. derived not from its, quote, warm welcoming of and accommodation to nationalistic, nationalist, ethnic, and linguistic differences, but from the ability and willingness of an Anglo elite to stamp its image on other people coming to this country. The result was a legacy of a cultural and ethnic predominance that would not tolerate conflict or confusion regarding the national identity. Probably no one expressed this more starkly and maybe more famously than Stuart Alsop's great uncle, Theodore Roosevelt, when he offered words of both welcome and warning to the waves of immigrants entering America at the turn of the last century. We have no room, he declared, for any people who do not act and vote simply as Americans. Newcomers who had become completely Americanized stand on exactly the same plane as the descendants of any Puritan, Cavalier, or Knickerbocker. But where immigrants or the sons of immigrants do not heartily and in good faith throw in their lot with us, 
but cling to the speech, the customs, the ways of life, and the habits of thought of the old world, they thereby harm both themselves and us. That was a powerful admonition, and it was a distillation of the concept, of course, as we know, of the melting pot, which Schwartz correctly notes amounted to the repression, not the celebration, of ethnic diversity. Now, the Industrial Revolution was in full force at that time, and there was a great need for these very workers. And the result, inevitably, was that there was no political wave emerging in America to curtail this immigrant wave until about the 1920s, when the immigration level reached a proportion that began to agitate the political mind. But generally, the wave of immigrants was not allowed to vitiate the Anglo-American dominance or, shall we say, the Anglo-American ethos. Still, it must be noted that many ethnic customs and folk ways were cherished and retained by these immigrants. This was, this was um, demonstrated to us by Nathan Glazer and Daniel Patrick Moynihan in their, in their groundbreaking 1963 study, Beyond the Melting Pot. But the citizens of whatever provenance were expected to sort of absorb the fundamental definition of America, the Anglo-Saxon ethos, and that was what Schwartz was getting at. Peter Schrag elaborated on that previously in writing. During the WASP ascendancy, it was assumed that the country didn't need to be reinvented. It was all given like a genetic code waiting to unfold. He added, we all wanted to learn the style, the proper accent, agreed on its validity, and while our interpretations and our heroes varied, they were all cut from the same stock. For good or ill, this gave the American nation a powerful sense of heritage. In turn, there was a strong sense of continuity and cohesion. The nation's past was intertwined with its present, which was assumed, it was assumed would also be connected to its future. And this cultural solidarity lasted through most of the American experience. It was not always pretty. Says Schwartz, the hegemony that unified America has been at bottom not so much cultural and linguistic as physical. He elaborates, America, America didn't just evolve, it was made by those who claimed it fiercely and rendered it in their image. This led to the expansionist impulse uh, that pushed America west, the Americans and the Anglo-Saxons west across the country. Uh, it led to war with Mexico. Uh, it led to uh, conquest and obliteration against Native American tribes whose devotion to their own lands, what they viewed as their land, stood in, in the way of the spread of the um, uh, English. Whatever moral conclusions we may want to draw from this suppression, and moral conclusions are certainly in order, America was not built on ethnic amity and tolerance, as that episode sadly demonstrates. Further, as Schwartz wrote in his essay, the U.S. wouldn't exist today in its present form if a more reasonable course had been pursued. I would note, without elaboration, because I don't have time, that it, the, sort of the difference in the cultural development of Mexico to our South and America uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries would attest to that. Thus do we see America's WASP elite both reflected and perpetrated through Anglo-Saxon sensibilities for 300 years. And it did so as its proportion of the population declined steadily. Schwartz calls this a, quote, remarkable achievement, namely that the American elites could dominate American cultural and political life for three centuries, in fact, define what it meant to be an American, even as a share of the population went down and down. Well, it couldn't last forever. And in the post war period, the 50s and the 60s, as America became less and less an Anglo-Saxon nation, it inevitably turned less and less to the old elite for guidance and leadership. The elite, in turn, became more and more insular, out of touch, one could say even disoriented. And one unavoidable result was that the old elite increasingly came under attack. Digby Baltzell, whom I quoted earlier, emerged as a powerful critic of the old elite. He defined it as an effort to maintain power and influence through exclusion, 
He called for a new authoritative leadership structure based on a new and representative upper class and establishment, which he defined as one that would dis discriminate on the basis of the distinguished accomplishments of individuals rather than classifying men categorically on the basis of their ethnic or racial origins. In other words, he was a calling for a meritocratic elite. And now we have one. So the question is, how has it served the nation? And to what extent has it contributed to, or perhaps exploited, the country's growing economic inequality? And to explore this, we return to Matthew Stewart and his provocative Atlantic piece of a year and a half ago or so, in which he posits the idea that the big winners in that inequality have been the top 0.1%, which represents just 160,000 households, the very, very rich, and also a very, very small proportion of America. But grabbing a big proportion of our wealth. The losers, he says, were the bottom 90%. And that leaves the 9.9% in the middle as the new American aristocracy, which he avers includes himself. He writes, we have left the 90% in the dust and we've been quietly tossing down roadblocks behind us to make sure they never catch up. Uh, as an example, I found this powerful. In 1963, a person in the middle of the nation's wealth distribution would have to multiply his wealth by six times in order to get into the top 9.9%. Now it's nine times, I mean, now it's 12 times. And to get into the middle of the 9.9%, the poor schmuck would have to maximize his wealth, increase its wealth by a factor of 25 times. Now if it's six times, you might have some hope and some dreams about where your life could take you financially. But 25 times, not very likely. And as Stuart points out, money isn't the entire picture here. The 9.9% enjoy huge advantages in educational opportunities, in access to health care, what he calls the health care cartel, which I think is a good description of it, and the ability to exploit the flow of money through commerce. This latter one is huge. It refers to the financialization of the U.S. economy, which is a great benefit to the 9.9%. Matthew Stewart notes that in the 1950s, one of every $40 in GDP went to the financial sector. Now it's $1 of every, $1 of every $12. Stewart writes that our current financial system has been engineered over decades by powerful bankers for their own benefit and for that of their posterity. These are the people who don't make anything. They create very few jobs, but they take a huge cut out of the economy every time a business transaction is conducted, far more than they did in the 1950s, which he uses as an example. I can't help using as an example of all this Richard Holbrook, who was a prominent diplomat and, a, pro and, and um, a government official in the foreign policy realm throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and into the 90s. And Richard Holbrook, when he wasn't working for the government, was pulled into the financial sector in Wall Street and giving jobs with tasks that were always very ill-defined. But he was able to make $6 million a year for doing what no one could quite understand. And his financial abilities and his financial acumen were such that he didn't know enough to know that even on $6 million a year, he couldn't maintain nine homes, and he therefore almost went into, into uh, bankruptcy before he died of a heart attack. Um, that's, the kind of, uh, that's the kind of thing of the happening within the 9.9% that um, Stewart is saying is getting noticed by the 90%. And Matthew Stewart further says that the tax system really benefits the 9.9% through lavish tax preferences worth in a single year, maybe as much as a billion dollars, nearly 40% going to the top 10% of earners. Also, in real estate inflation, there's a striking increase in economic segregation. And as we're seeing increasingly in physical segregation, the result is growing political resentment as reflected in the 2016 election results. It was clear from those results there's an unmistakable cleavage between the 9 percenters and the 90 percenters. Hillary Clinton counties uh, accounted for 64% of GDP, the counties that voted for her. Trump counties, 36%. 
Clinton County's median home value, 250,000K, uh, 250K. Trump County's median home value, 154K. Clinton County's real estate values up by 27% between 2000 and 2016, adjusted for inflation. Trump County's up by just 6%. The same cleavage in educational levels is seen. The 50 most educated counties in the country went very, very heavily for Clinton. The 50 least educated counties in the country went heavily for Trump. Now Stewart, in positing all this and clarifying and pulling together this stuff, um, presents a laudable social and political analysis as far as it goes. But his preoccupation, in my view, with economic and social well-being to the exclusion of other things leads him astray. He writes that our national polarization is just the loud aftermath of escalating inequality. He gives the game away when he suggests that our agitated 90 percenters are rather like those same types of people in the 1920s, another era of growth but growing inequality, who, he notes, he says, he alleges, went to KKK rallies and railed against mooching immigrants. And there you have it, an outlook that calls to mind Barack Obama's famous, some say infamous, expression of 2008 about frustrated working class Americans. It's worth repeating in full. They get bitter. They cling to guns and religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustration. Now at the time, he was running against Hillary Clinton for the Democratic nomination, and she promptly labeled such expressions elitist. But it must take one to know one, because her basket of deplorables comment was directed at essentially the same people. What we see here, I believe, is the hoary old liberal notion that as long as the unwashed are adequately fed and clothed, they won't go astray with faulty notions about the country's definition or its identity. Those delicate matters belong to the elites. They will tell us what to think and what not to think. Matthew Stewart seems to be saying that the sooner the 9.9% addresses the resentment of the 90% through redistribution initiatives from government, the sooner the country can get on with the task of redefining itself. As he put it, as long as inequality rules, reason will be absent from our politics meaning that those people from the 90% are out of reason, they're out of, they don't understand the world. This is a cop-out, and that's a kind word for it. It misses a huge segment of what's going on in American politics. And so we turn once again to Christopher Lash in his 1995 book, Revolt of the Elites, which offers a far more robust and probing analysis of all of this. He argues that the destructive nature of the new elite goes beyond economics, although that's a significant part of it, goes deeper to profound questions of who we are, how we reconcile our present with our past and our future. Like Stewart, he believes the new elites have ignored the fate of those below. Elites, he says, who define the issues have lost touch with the people. And bear in mind, this is 1995. But he goes further, painting a picture of an elite that harbors little sentiment of noblesse oblige toward the common people, favors globalism over patriotism, and patriotism over globalism had been our history for most of our existence, accepts assaults on free speech in the academy, sh um, sneeringly assaults the national heritage and foundations of Western thought, promotes a politics of diversity and identity to, de to the detriment of civic harmony, fosters civic rancor through its open borders advocacy, and employs powerful weapon words, racist, sexist, xenophobe, to stifle debate on matters it wants handled out of the established halls of discourse. Lash writes, the new elite, those who control the international flow of money and information, preside over philanthropic foundations and institutions of higher learning, manage the instruments of cultural production, and thus set the terms of public debate, have lost faith in the values, or what remains of them, of the West. Indeed, he adds, for many of the people, uh, of the elite uh, folks, the very term Western civilization conjures up images of abuse, victimization, and patriarchal oppression. 
Lash offers an explanation as to why the new elites wish to rip the American polity away from the moorings of its heritage. The, meritocra the meritocracy, he says, must maintain the fiction, he says it's a fiction, that its power and privileges rest entirely on its own brilliance, rather than those roadblocks that Matthew Stewart said were being tossed down behind them. Hence, he explains, the elite has little sense of ancestral gratitude or of an obligation to live up to the responsibilities of the past. Ancestral gratitude, an interesting word. Thus do we see that a mortal threat to that continuity of past, present, and future um, exists, uh, which, but it was the same thing that was so much a part of the Anglo-Saxon era. In his last book, the late Samuel Huntington of Harvard posited the thesis that America had embraced over its history four elements of identity, race, ethnicity, culture, and creed. According to Huntington, and I think that most historians would agree, since the mid 20th century, race has essentially been eliminated as a significant element of national identity. And that was, in the view of many, a salutary development. Um, race consciousness now uh, is mostly on the fringes if in terms of, of um, what, racial policies. Ethnicity emerged as a significant political issue largely through those waves of immigrants from largely southern and eastern Europe of 1890 to 1920s uh, that, that um, um, Teddy Roosevelt was talking about. But over time, as Huntington notes, there was a tremendous amount of assimilation of those people, uh, especially during World War II, and ethnicity largely was eliminated as an element of identity. But, writes Huntington, America retained what he described as a mainstream Anglo-Protestant culture in which most of its people, whatever their subcultures, and that's worth noting, whatever their subcultures, have shared. For almost four centuries, this culture, he, he continues, of the founding settlers has been the central and lasting component of the American identity. So, what he's saying is that these old perceptions animated much of American thinking through the centuries, whatever their subculture. In 1789, in Federalist Number 2, John Jay identified the central components of American unity as common interest, ancestry, no longer there, language, religion, principles of government, manners and customs, war experience. Now this common, as I say, common industry is gone. But others remain in, in some degree, though diluted significantly in some instances and altered in others. Two centuries later, after John Jay, Arthur Sessinger Jr. wrote uh, in a book called The Disuniting of America, which was a call against the fragmenting of America through identity politics. He said, the language of the new nation, its laws, its institutions, its political ideals, its literature, its customs, its precepts, its prayers, primarily derived from Britain. And he issued a warning against what he called ethnocentric separatists who attack America's sinful European inheritance and seek to divide Americans. That was in 1991, a long time ago. What he was talking about has continued to ribbon through American society. This cultural core of America described by Jay Schlesinger and Huntington also gave birth to the American creed, the fourth element of the American identity. The creed, of course, is our, gov our hallowed governmental systems, our approach to governance. Uh, and it consisted largely in what Huntington describes as the political principles of liberty, equality, democracy, individualism, human rights, the rule of law, and private property. In other words, the American creed encompassed our hallowed principles of government. Huntington posits that the creedal definition allows Americans to view their country as exceptional, built on universal principles applicable to all mankind. And here we get to the crux of what's going on in American society as reflected in the rise of the meritocratic elite. And to the crux of America's epic struggle between that new elite and the mainstream populace. 
The elites want to wipe away all aspects of the cultural core except the creed, which, beyond the creed, is the last patch of American identity. As globalists, they have developed a concept, a contempt, for American nationalism, including any view of the national identity. They also take delight in the idea that America is exceptional precisely because its essence is universal in scope and not national. Therefore, what we have in our nation is applicable to all mankind, not to the nation itself. But a question remains, can a creed alone sustain a nation? Huntington thought not. He, he's, he's since dead, since he wrote his last book. A creed, he wrote, a, a creed alone does not a nation make. But also, it's clear that millions of Americans of many ethnic and racial backgrounds have a reverence for the country's traditional core culture. They revere the creed, of course, but for many, the creed is not enough. And also, the creedal preoccupation with American exceptionalism and universalism has generated a, promiscu a troubling promiscuousness in foreign policy that, in turn, has led America into a lot of wars in the last 25 years. Lash captured this gaping cultural and political chasm when he noted that most members of the elite think globally, not nationally. He says there is a question whether they think of themselves as Americans at all. That's extremely harsh, and I would not put my stamp of approval on that sentence, um, but it's, it is interesting that he would make that statement. Lash, I will note, was no kind of a conservative. He was a Marxist, by the way. He wrote also that there is a question, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, Patriotism, he said, leaves these people cold, whereas multiculturalism excites them. Quote, conjuring up the agreeable image of a global bazaar in which exotic cuisine, exotic styles of dress, exotic music, exotic tribal customs can be savored indiscriminately with no questions asked and no commitments required. We must pause over those last three words, no commitments required. It seems to sum up, in the view of many, the new elite's regard toward the rest of society, which is a far cry from the old WASP establishment. Now we have an elite that separates itself from the nation at large, that seeks to transform it through increasingly aggressive open borders um, um, uh, political action, demonstrates contempt for large numbers of citizens who resist this project, has presided over the destruction of industrial America, and dismisses the Western heritage as a guide for today or tomorrow. You don't have to be a political savant to see a connection between all of this and the rise of Donald J. Trump. Matthew Stewart saw it, but alas, he saw it through the prism of his fellow 9.9 percenters, which was revealed in a single sentence in his essay, which belies his claim to speak for the 90 percent. Quote, with his utter lack of policy knowledge and belligerent commitment to maintaining his ignorance, Trump is the perfect representative for a population whose idea of good governance is just to scramble the eggheads. Meaning, basket of deplorables, clinging to guns and religion? Yes, Trump has an utter lack of policy knowledge, and he parades his belligerent commitment to maintaining his ignorance with stunning stubbornness. He's also a boor, a cad, a phony, a misfit, and a beastly human being. But somehow, he perceived through instinct what Christopher Lash discerned through prodigious inquiry. The elites were taking America where roughly half of America didn't want to go. That was not sustainable then, and it's not sustainable now. In taking on the elites, Trump brought to the four issues and issue prescriptions that the elites wanted to keep out of the tumult of stump politics. Bear in mind that when Trump, in the first debate, said, you wouldn't even be talking about immigration if it hadn't been for me, he was precisely correct, because every other candidate on both sides of the aisle was trying to avoid talking about immigration because it was too incendiary and they wanted to save it for when they could handle it in Congress or maybe through the courts or through the, the, the bureaucracy. Um, for good or ill, this man has transformed the immigration debate. He's brought forward new trade concepts assaulted the foreign policy establishment, questioned the prevailing global order, taken on the regulatory bureaucracy, embraced judicial conservatism, along with 
having done many stupid things. All this rep re represented a direct assault on the new elite, which didn't see it coming and still doesn't understand it. They seem to think if they can just get rid of this political intruder, everything can, everything can go back to where it was. It isn't going to work that way. Any political, my political antenna tell me that we will be rid of him at the next election. It will be done constitutionally, without any question, and it will be done cleanly. But the epic struggle between America's meritocratic elite and large segments of the citizenry will not go away anytime soon. I think it's going to continue to be a bumpy ride. Thank you very much. I think I'm uh, here to uh, answer any questions or comments or re re receive comments. Yes. Thank you for that. that was very interesting. Um, so I'd like to like to raise a few points quickly, if I may. So one is that you spend a fair amount of time on some of the quantitative aspects. So, for example, the earnings and the ability to move from one part of a class to another. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, the quantitative aspect, so the, the numbers. You talk about the economic situation six times, 12 times, 25 mm -hmm. times. Um, and I, I listen to that very carefully, but it seems to me that this is uh, at least one of the two areas that comes up a lot in trying to describe what happened. Um, I know it, you, can, you can create a map on the basis of which counties are more or less rich in the United States. However, what I want to suggest is the following. So when you look at the psychological studies about um, de-individuation, which means when you identify with a group, so you see yourself as a member of a group. So an example saying, I'm American, uh, means you're an interchangeable member of a group, rather than saying, my name is uh, Robert or whatever, which would be individuation. Um, and the basic uh, the results from that, which have been confirmed more than once, is that uh, subjective identification trumps, forgive the pun, um, objective classification. So it matters a lot more how you see yourself than what your revenue is or your class. So this explains why, for example, um, African Americans who are affluent will be affected by policy, helping poor African Americans will support it, uh, why members of the working class who don't particularly identify with the working class will vote for policies that might not be in their economic interest. So it seems to me that one issue that's left behind is it's not so much, okay, look at these uh, divisions in terms of money, it's more like, okay, well, how do they see themselves fundamentally? And I think this is where we get to the idea of these strivers is that I think the strivers are very deep and comfortable with description. Uh, description as in an identity is given to you, not chosen. So if you think of yourself as having earned everything you have, uh, then you're going to say that basically who you are is what you've made of yourself. Whereas the very idea of when we talk about ancestor, gratitude, or worship, which is basically nor in anything else, anthropologically speaking, um, that recognizes that you have an identity which is given to you, which is conferred to you independently of a choice, and you retain independently of some degree independently of your choice. So it seems to me that a, a large bit of these strivers do not identify, do not primarily identify with their fellow nationals. I think a huge problem is that I, I think that the author you don't want to put your stamp of approval is perhaps closer to the truth. I think there's a real sense of not belonging. Uh, and so I'll just give you a, an example of something that is not American, but I think uh, pushes towards the same concept. So after the terrorist attacks in 2015 in France, there was a debate about um, withdrawing nationality from those who had attacked the nation. So basically, people who people considered traitors or enemies. <coughs> now, what wound up happening is that the, the law was not passed, but there was interesting polling that was done at the time. So roughly speaking, 84% of French voters who were either for the Socialist Party, which was in power with François Hollande, or were inclined to vote for them, so slightly broader penumbra, they were massively in favor of it, 84% roughly. And then 84% of the parliamentarians who were representing the presidential majority, they were against the idea. They were outraged by the idea you could take away a passport from someone who had murdered their fellow citizens. Just right? the opposite. So almost a perfect flip image. It might have been 1 2 percent point off, but it's roughly mm -hmm. just over 80% from mm -hmm. either side. It's a very stunning number because it's a huge majority. And I think here is when you, when you listen to them speak, they don't seem to, uh, to care very much about this notion of their, their, their fellow nationals. They see themselves as guardians of humanity or something like this. Uh, and this is obviously not America, this is France. And I think you also will get this in one last example uh, about subjective identification is 1914-18. Uh, so when you use a huge amount of correspondence you can read, it seems like the two groups that are really, really big on the group are the working class and the aristocrats. The aristocrats are actually <coughs> quite keen on dying in the front. They're not shirking. 
Uh, when you look at who are the pacifists, who are the objectors, either during the war or after the war, they're almost all from the middle class. And then when you find the, later on, a lot of these will become the collaborators and the mini schwas, those who are in favor of the union. Uh, again, they come from the same class, uh, class of strivers, class of people who have, the, they accept they owe social elevation, they owe to their own efforts. Uh, so I, I want to suggest that there's something about striving that affects your subjective identification very deeply. Uh, and it doesn't seem to affect it on the other two poles of society. If you're scribe an identity at the top as an aristocrat, or perhaps you've inherited that identity, you probably don't feel like you can ever wear your way out of it. But I think there's something deeply uh, problematic about the way strivers develop a certain kind of subjective identification, independently of their objective uh, material wealth. Uh, well, I find that very, very fascinating and intriguing, and I think that's precisely what Lash was saying when he's trying to explain why the strivers are the strivers, um, that they feel a need to, um, to explain themselves based on the fact that they had made it, and therefore they didn't want, they didn't like the idea that, that, uh, that they were tied to anything from the past. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, sir, back there. Well, I'm, I'm curious about the concept of Because I, I, I was having a hard time following where you were going. Because everything that you said up to where you talked about the counties that voted for Trump and Clinton made total sense to me. You talked about the history of America, and you were honest about it. But then a few minutes later, you sort of contradicted it by saying that those who want to recognize the somewhat negative aspects of the history of America are being questioned in some way as being not nationalistic, because God forbid we question what happened to the Indians, or we question the treatment of the blacks, or whatever. Those are part of our history. And to some of us, that, those aren't good parts of our history, and those can't be parts of our future. So if we question that, if we look at America as having had some blemishes in its behavior, does that somehow make me not American? Does that make me part of that group that you're talking about that wants to destroy everything? Because to me, it, it means questioning our future in a way that, that we don't do those things again. And it looks in some cases like we're headed in that direction. But in terms of national identity, what is the national identity? What is an American? Uh, I take your point. Um, I, I think I attempted to bow to your point a bit when, when I talked about how it wasn't always pretty during the Anglo-Saxon era and that, that it's very understandable why people would raise moral questions regarding the fate of the Indians, for example, or many, many other things. Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, it, it, it seems to me that, and, and, and I, I think also another part of your point, which I think is more implicit, which I credit, is that you can separate that aspect from the globalist outlook of many of the new elite. Um, but often, they go together. And so to the extent that I put them together uh, without maybe adequately identifying them as being separate and distinct, um, I'll take your criticism. Although when you say I was honest up to that point, I, I hope you're not saying I was dishonest afterwards. No, 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 no I'm, just being, I'm, 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 I'm just being facetious. I, I love how you really were sort of brutally up front about, you, you put your own opinion in there, you said, and I, I understand, but I, I think the point I want to make, and, and maybe I made it, but, but the, the, the globalist outlook, which is anti-nationalist, ultimately, and gets to the whole question of, of America as an exceptional uh, nation built on ideas that are not national, nationalist at all, have no significant heritage, uh, and, and the assault on the heritage that is ongoing and increasing in our society uh, go together. I think it's totally acceptable and, and appropriate to say that they're two separate things. And, and you, I could be criticized for nudging them together. Um, but nevertheless, they often seem to go together uh, in, in, in discourse in America today. But I take your point. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, so I have two questions for you. Um, one thing you talked about was the reduction of open borders, uh, saying that the global elite want to include open borders. Uh, but what do you think about saying that the open border policy, which has been happening you know, up until World War II, 
has enabled the identity of this melting pot of America. And obviously, probably most of us in the room came in during a time of open borders, allowing our ancestry to come in and make the opportunity of either coming to the global elite or be part of the middle class in America. And saying that now, open borders aren't acceptable. The other question is about globalization and about since World War II, the policy of globalization and forming the global economy has created massive amounts of wealth, not only for America and the American elite, but also for the, the world in general. And saying that globalization isn't as good as nationalization, I might not necessarily agree on a moral level because it has enabled so many more people around the world to have at least a sense of entrepreneurship and a sense of being connected to the world and improved from an economic and also hunger standpoint. I understand that point. Let me go back to the, to the um, question of borders and immigration. I think I, think I would probably um, have a little disputation with you on the question of, of what's the history of these borders and, and um, to what extent are we a product of that. So let me pose a thought. To me, the most significant metric in political terms to understand the significance of where we are in immigration at any given time is the proportion of our population at that moment that is foreign born. And I went back and checked this out because I had a sense of it and it turns out my sense was right. When I listened to an NPR report, I don't remember it exactly, but it had to do with the immigration issue and the NPR anchor, um, Steve Inskeep, I think, um, or attempted to make the point that that we have that that metric in today is 14 is approaching 14 percent. It may be over by now, and he said uh, people should understand that when those immigrants from the turn of the last century were coming over, it was 14 percent then too. So what he was saying essentially was that get over it, folks. 14 percent now. What's the problem? What he didn't say. And, and well, I think he was, what he ought to have said, if he wanted to give a clear understanding of all this, was that yes, after a period of well, not much immigration after the Civil War, not, under, not, not surprising given the havoc of that period, um, and with the increase in industrialization, it went up significantly and it got to 14%. When it got to 14%, people began to become concerned about assimilation. They weren't concerned about it when it was at 7% or even 10%, but 14% seemed to kick something into gear with regard to where are we in this country and where is this country going and to what extent, if this continues, if it got to 18% or 19%, what would that do? How, how would assimilation work? How would it define us or redefine us? And then it went down as a result of the, of the 1924 legislation, which a lot of people denigrate and despise. Um, but it was a result of a political feeling that was generated by a perceived potential problem in America. So that by 1975, that percentage was down to 7%. So you have to say that immigration was thoroughly under control. We weren't an anti-immigrant country, but we had a level of, immigrant, of, of, of immigration that didn't raise questions about difficulties of assimilation. And since that time, steadily, largely through family um, uh, immigration, um, it has gone up and up and up, and now it's back to 14%. And sure enough, we're experiencing the same political concerns that happened the last time it got to 14%. And it's probably the same concern that's going to happen the next time you get to 14%. But when you ask some, I ask some of my Democratic friends or liberal friends who are pro-immigration, I say, I explain all this. And I say, so give me your thought. What do you think would be an appropriate um, percentage? And what should we shoot for now that we've reached this point where we have an agitation, where, where this issue could be the single most significant issue that brings to our presidency a man like Donald Trump? I can't get an answer. I say 18, 21, can't get an answer. What does that mean? To me, it means that they don't care about it. But what they're saying is they don't care about the concerns, legitimate concerns of people who are raising questions in their minds and now increasingly politically 
about the assimilation question. On the, on, on the, uh, on the uh, question of uh, uh, global warming, uh, gl did you it's mention global on, warming? It's on the globalization. Ah, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think you gave a very uh, el eloquent, distilled view of, of the globalist outlook. Um, and I credit that outlook. I don't agree with it, but I, I understand it, um, and I, I, I certainly consider it worthy. I'm an opponent of it, uh, but it's a worthy outlook, and it is, you know, it's, it's widespread. Let me get, to, yes. I understand, and uh, and I I I would be more inclined to go with the economic than the other, as as I gather you would be, so that the EU would raise questions in your mind, but not free trade. Um, I think there's a significant uh, distinction to be drawn there. Um, I think that we've reached a point um, where you know free trade with China, for example, however, has become highly problematic. And the elites weren't doing very much as China was shaking down American businesses and stealing our technology and all the rest of it. Um, and and uh, this, as a country, we were under, undertaking policies that was hollowing out our industrial base and destroying in good industrial jobs. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I see a distinction, but um, uh, I'm not sure that the distinction really means much anymore. Mary. Regardless of what happens to Donald Trump, um, do you feel that his uh, presidency has permanently altered the face of American conservatism, or do you think it's more of a flash in the pan if he does not want to that will then give way to the restoration of a more traditional uh, conservative Republican I think the conservative, I think the Reagan, the Reagan conservatism, excuse me, say Goldwater, Buckley, Reagan conservatism. Which you know, was, you know, sort of um, um, nurtured in the '60s and emerged in the '80s. Uh, I think that's dead. Um, I, I don't think that's going to resonate with the American people. We're in a new era and uh, new structures and realities. Um, I think that a lot of the uh, issues that brought Trump forward, because no one else was talking those issues, um, are not going to go away. And that somehow they have to be domesticated, and and you know the, the harsh edges filed off and and pulled together into something. Trump had, maintains a, a very solid 40% constituency. He can't get reelected with a 40% constituency, but but he has it, and it's solid. And that that indicates that that you know somehow it has to get absorbed into the rest of American politics. Doesn't mean it's going to run it, or it's going to be, um, it's going to dominate it, or it's going to dictate direction, but it has to be accommodated at least sufficiently to siphon off enough of those people to create a governing coalition. Is there any politician on the scene who can do that, either right or left? And I think it can be done from the left. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, maybe Elizabeth Warren. But, the next question that we face, if we do have a president who can create a, let's say, an electoral coalition to get elected, then it has to work. And can you, can you generate growth and maintain jobs and, and um, 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 you know, satisfy the economic needs and, and, and also would that, what would that do in terms of these cultural issues I talk about? I don't know. And if um, we have an experiment in social, um, uh, in democratic socialism and it fails, then my fear is that the country is going to be that much more roiled and uh, we're going to be struggling and more and more uh, we're going to be turning to all kinds of uh, um, alternatives because we don't know where else to go as, as an electorate, as a nation. Yes? So you talked about the creed of the country and that's one of the only core things that you still see left. Um, I personally see with the Trump administration and currently with the impeachment process as well as the last three years, the complete destruction of the creed um, that I see in American government and my trust in American government as an establishment in this country. How do we 
bring those identities back of, of true creed, true responsible government, as well as a news media that we can trust um, for both the left and right. Uh, and with polarization of you know, people with distinct identities that want to keep their ethnic you know, religions, culture, food, as well as people from you know, the lower class extreme right who believe in Trump um, and believe in his policies and believe is an extreme anti-immigrant things. How do we bring that together to actually form a government that is bureaucratic but also functions and can be compromised and collaborate? Well, let me say, uh, first of all, that I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying about Trump and I don't gainsay it at all. Um, I would only add, however, that the assault on the creed, that is to say, our hallowed structures of governance and practices of government, of governance, have been eroding for a long time. And the idea that we'd have a president uh, like Barack Obama who would basically say, I've got a pen and a phone, um, and I'll, I'll do it uh, through executive uh, order. Uh, then you get the next president comes in and he uses executive order to undo all of that and do his own thing. Um, uh, that is not a healthy situation for an American democracy and those kinds of things. Um, uh, the the bureaucratiz bureaucratization of American politics, American governance, has put a lot of incustrations on our system over the decades since James Burnham wrote his famous 1940 book, um, The um, Managerial Revolution. And we're now in full flight in terms of that managerial revolution. And um, the, the governmental stranglehold is powerful and not what the founders intended. So that's been going on for a long time. How do we get beyond? I, look, we, we're, we live in a presidential system for good or ill. And you know, we don't have a parliamentary system. So we have to look to the president. We can't, it, takes, it takes presidential leadership to pull America out of a crisis. That's our history, our, our history tells us that. Um, and that's our situation now. Uh, and uh, I don't see anyone on the horizon that can do that. You never do see them until they emerge. People thought that Franklin Roosevelt was kind of a country squire idiot and they thought Lincoln was a country bumpkin. Um, but um, uh, that's what it's gonna take. And I have to say that right now, I'm not very sanguine about anything happening that's going to pull us out of this anytime soon. Uh, let me get anyone else. Sorry, um, the second half of what I said earlier had to do with what, it, what is it to be an American and it's a follow-up to what you just said, that if you tell an incoming immigrant that they need to assimilate, the question I would ask is, to what? Do you need to become a Christian? Do you need to learn to speak English? Do you need to, what do you need to do in order to fulfill the the image that we as Americans have of Americans. And you know, the, the disparity, for instance, uh, the stuff that went on in Charlottesville, to me, that's it's horrible, and I would border on saying it's un-American, and yet given our history, it's very American. So that may, you know, so I, I struggle with the fact that there are people, wasps living in this country, for whom I feel as much separation culturally as I might for any other race living in this country. So I'm curious at this point in our <coughs> history and moving forward, what is it to be an American? Well, it's in flux, obviously, and um, and that question is going to be it's going to be a question of of um, adjudication, political adjudication, for a long time to come. And I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm 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 not going to attempt to answer it in terms of what I think it is to be American, and whatever it is, I'm not going to try to enforce it on anyone else. Well, I would be curious to know if you point, maybe I can talk to you afterward, pointing me in some directions to read, because I think with the flash that was talking about the list of things that were American, or maybe, maybe I didn't follow. Um, I'll direct you to Samuel Huntington, who was probably the greatest political scientist of his generation from Harvard, uh, who um, wrote numerous books, all of which were castigated when they came out, and all of which were later um, adjudged to have been rather prescient. Any, anyone else? Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. So the questioners have largely said how their creed has been destroyed by the current administration. I've lived a long time. My creed was destroyed when President Obama used the IRS and the Department of Justice 
weaponize them to take on his political opponents. He took the most important, potent agency in the world, the IRS, and used those to take on his political opponents and really destroy their ability to raise cash, to raise money, to counter his election by stopping the creation of political powers. The question for you is separate from that. <clears throat> the question for you that I would add is, over the past years, <clears throat> probably during the Republican administrations and Democratic, we've seen the elites, which we're talking about tonight, take on a much, much bigger role in telling each of us what we can and cannot do. They tell us what we can, what kind of car we can buy in places like this. They tell you what kind of house you can build, how big, where the windows need to be, what kind of trees you can put in front of the windows. And very disturbingly recently, they're telling us what we can say. Comments? Well, all that is, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what that I, 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 I don't know that I embrace everything you're saying, but, but, but what you're saying is part and parcel of what I said in answering this question over here, in which I said that, um, that the assault on the American creed long predates uh, Donald J. Trump. And I believe that, and I, think, I certainly think that the IRS scandal is a perfect example. Um, when Barack Obama issued his executive order uh, on the on the dreamers, which I haven't agree with, uh, it it was it was totally unconstitutional, and then Trump comes in and takes an executive order to undo it, and the courts label that unconstitutional. So what kind of government of laws do we have in a situation like that? So I understand your point. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you maybe refresh us? What did Obama and the IRS do? Stop. Conservative pact from raising money. Um, uh, tax free status. They would not allow conservative pacts to raise money. Uh, a lot of people think that conservatives spend a lot more money in the elections. Obama spent over twice as much money as his opponents on both elections. And he did that largely by stopping these pacts from getting their 503C 501C status um, so that they could not raise money. So the liberal democratic PACs raised hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and the conservatives were unable to raise money <coughs> because their PACs did not get tax-free status from Willis Lerner, who was the head of the IRS at that point. Um, okay. the, what I consider to be the best book on this is by Grover Norquist, and he, he goes into a great deal of detail on exactly what took place there. Um, anyone else? Okay, yeah. Um, one question I have for you is what do you define as the meritocracy of the elite? Are we including only liberals or also Republicans? Because in my perspective, I see both in a wide range. When I look at Dick Cheney, for example, who we've actually used the office of the vice president to literally make money for himself and the start of actually credit, like, increasing um, you know, presidential privilege and electoral privilege, which I see as actually the start of it. You know, for the Bush administration and the Clinton administration, that is actually been seen to create, you know, being degraded over time, but how you use that to push the United States into war, you know, and all those other methods that as the Vice President. Oh, oh the, the, the elite has captured both parties. This is not a partisan matter at all. And it's, uh, certainly with regard to the foreign policy of the United States, which I think has been egregious uh, since the end of the Cold War, and uh, um, um, the the establishment, uh, what they call the uh, the deep state, uh, it doesn't care about partisanship at all. So no, or or also in terms of in the in the area of big finance, um, you know, after the great recession, the great uh, recession we had in uh, 2007 and eight, um, the the policy of the government was to make sure that the that the big banks and the big financial institutions were essentially bailed out so that the market could not clear which was devastating to small banks and local banks all over america and my friend david smick in his book the great um, oh heck i can't remember the name of it now he said that represented probably the greatest transfer of wealth from the middle class to the upper class in the history of the world <laughs> So yeah, it's not a partisan thing at all. Yes. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, I think that the, the point you brought up about the American 
three and this gentleman's follow up on that question. I'd like to push it just a little bit further because I think it might be the most critical question facing the country today, and we have to attempt to define it, um, no matter how much we disagree about it. Um, we have to talk about it. Um, I wonder if it has to do with the reason it's it's such a volatile issue before us is because it's so fundamental. But the American creed is, I mean, it goes back to what Lincoln called the central idea, conceived of liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The problem is we understand not only equality different today, but we understand humanity differently today, about what it means to be human and how we should live our lives. So I'd like to turn the question back um, um, to you and, and what you what you raised and to say, is it possible for us um, to come together uh, when we disagree so much about those things to, if not recapture, reclaim the American creed um, to find a way to live together with it, with the differences? Um. Well, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I frankly don't know. And, and, um, but I do know that it gets to the immigration question. Because when you get up to a level of 14%, as I was saying before, you're beginning to, you're beginning to generate um, concerns and agitation on the part of the electorate over that very question. So the question I have is then if that's the case, then why do we want to go there? Why do we want to continue to have 14% or let it go up to 19%? Why wouldn't we slowly put a bit of a damper on it until we can ensure that we have an assimilation going that addresses your question? Can we do that? I don't know. Is it too late? I don't know. Um, but I'm trying, when, in this, with this uh, little uh, musings, what I tried to do was uh, explain what I see is happening in terms of American society. And, and you're absolutely right that this um, is highly emotional because it's definitional. It's definitional in terms of people's identity, but it's also definitional in terms of the national identity. Uh, let me just make sure there's no one else. You're on. So, uh, to answer maybe my opinion on that question, I think uh, the erosion Break the rules on an international level, you may or may not get punished. If you enrich yourself while you were in office, you may or may not get punished. And the policies that you put through, if they're in the best interest of the 0.1% or even the top 10%, is that okay? Or should we be making policies that are more thinking, more, uh, more broadly? Getting to deal with some of the hard questions that need to be answered about immigration and about the environment and about various other things that are going to mean, yeah, we're going to have to regulate. Yeah, we're going to have to do some things that you don't want to do. Just like when you go to the dentist, if the dentist is in your court and the dentist says, if you don't get these teeth fixed now, you're going to have big problems when you get older. If the dentist is taking money from the company that sells whatever it is and says, you know, we could do this and that would benefit me. And it would also benefit you. To me, those are different kinds of, of government and I would like to see a government that I really feel is in is thinking in the best interest for all of us, not just themselves. Well, consider this. I mean, here we're, we're mired in politics and the economics and the machinations of Ukraine, right? And, you know, he did it or he did it or Joe Biden was corrupt or Hunter Biden shouldn't have done that and look at Trump's people. And it's just, well, where did it all start? It started when people began to think, and it's not just Ukraine, but I'll use it as an example, that, you know, I can work for this government and then I can go over to places like Ukraine and I can make millions of dollars. And so they descend down in these and they get into these arrangements 
and you have Paul Manafort, he's in jail, and, and, uh, and, and maybe uh, he's in jail because, because some Ukrainians were playing footsie with people from the Obama administration. I don't know, but that's the accusation, and that's almost inevitable. And then you've got Hunter Biden going in there, you know, um, with uh, $60,000 a month uh, to do what nobody seems to know what is. Um, and uh, someone says, well, that's corrupt. Um, what happened to America when this is the sort of, this is what we do um, in, as part of our government uh, service, that we leverage it? Uh, let me give an example. One of, one of the, I was thinking of giving a lecture here about my thinking regarding the analogy, the, the disturbing, um, ominous analogy between where we are in the American Republic today in our history and the history of the Roman Republic and its 100-year decline. Um, and one of the things that emerged uh, at one point during the Republic, which we never would have been thought of before, as it became more and more of a global or Mediterranean-wide entity, is they would take these generals and they, who, who did well and they would send them off to Spain to be the proconsul in Spain, whereupon they would glom onto the mineral rights of Spain and become extremely wealthy. Um, Gaius Marius was a good example of that. He became extremely rich. He, he wasn't part of the aristocracy, which is why he married into the Caesar family, so he could have the aristocratic name, or he could be, have the aristocratic connection, as well as the money, because the Caesars had the aristocratic connection, but no money. Um, well, are we reaching that stage in America? I don't know. but. I can't help but be haunted by the question. My, my two 16-year-old boys were really beginning to question what their world's going to look like when they're my age, and I think that's the question we should be addressing. Yeah, yeah. Any, anything else? OK. Do you see the value of the dollar being impacted in the future? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, I think the dollar is going to become under increasing strain. Um, I think that's what, uh, you know, that's what China wants. When the dollar replaced the pound, that was the, that was the, that was the turning point for when America replaced Britain as the significant power on the globe. And if, the, um, if uh, our dollar gets replaced by the Chinese currency, um, that's going to happen to us. Okay. To answer your question, um, I think for me, the most important thing is not to look at the political issues uh, of this country, but to collaborate on creating economic wealth for the majority of this country uh, by not only looking at the industrial practices, but service packages. <coughs> and in the multifaceted identities of our culture, uh, to create entrepreneurship that will help both our national identity and our nation and the world. Seem to be running out of questions. We're close to the end of the time here. We've got a little reception time, so we'll Okay. Well, re receptions are always good. Yeah, they're good. I mean, I'll thank our speaker and then go talk with him and ask him. Well, thank you very much. A real, a real pleasure.